These two uh, chapters, the latter part of each of these chapters deal with the rapture of the church. If you've read your Bible, uh, you probably knew that. And he deals uh, with the Lord Jesus coming to get uh, the church, to get the saved. And uh, I believe that's going to be very soon. Amen. I believe he's coming uh, very soon to uh, get the church. If you look at what Jesus said uh, in the book of Matthew, and I believe in Luke where he says that as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot, uh, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. The coming of the Son of Man right there deals with his second coming. It does not deal with the rapture of the church. And if, if we're living in the days of Noah and, and of Lot, then imagine how much closer the rapture of the church has to be tonight. And boy, I'm telling you, he's coming and he's coming very soon. By the way, when you look at what it talks about in the days of Lot, they were uh, marrying and giving in marriage and, and, and building and, and all these. Don't even talk about sodomy or none of that stuff. Uh, he was just saying that their, their life was going on. Even in Noah's day, their life was going on. The Bible said, and knew not, the Bible said, until the flood came and took them away. And they were just going on with life. They were uh, eating, they were marrying and giving in marriage, they were building, they were planning, they were doing what they'd always done, but nothing had never changed for them. And they were not looking for the Lord. But let's look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's stand our feet tonight, uh, if we would, in reverence to reading God's Word. Choir, I appreciate the singing tonight. Amen. Appreciate the good singing now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look in verse 13. But I don't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Boy, ain't them some good verses. And he said this, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray and then we'll read 1 Corinthians. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. Uh, we thank you for helping us this morning, but uh, morning time is over with and it's preaching time now tonight. And I pray that you'd help us while we might stand to preach. Uh, touch us and anoint us afresh from heaven. That face one here lost, that Lord, they'd get pricked in their heart how by the Holy Spirit about their lost condition and come and get saved tonight. Might we see as we preach tonight, and these dear folk listen, uh, not only with their ears, but with their heart tonight, to see that you're soon to come, and we need to be about your business tonight. Lord, would you again, I just ask for help. Might you be honored and glorified in this message for these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You'll be seated, but take your Bible and go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tonight. And 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter. He deals with uh, the resurrection through this whole chapter. And here at the end, uh, he deals with the resurrection of the dead in Christ. And in verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That sleep there that he's referring to is dying. He's uh, talking about we're not all going to die, uh, but we're all going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and mobile, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. So as we look at these two passages tonight, I, I, I believe that it would be hard to argue uh, that the rapture of the church is a real thing. 
I think it would be hard to argue that uh, that you know a lot of people want to talk about how that uh, when the end comes, the end comes, and uh, God will just uh, divvy us up over there and judge us out. Uh, you know, in Matthew chapter twenty-five, between the uh, sheep and the goats, which is uh, the judgment of nations. By the way, how uh, nations treated Israel uh, in the tribulation period, and they think that time's just going to come to an end. But I believe that Jesus uh, is going to come and get to church very soon. Uh, and I also believe, and I believe this church believes, and you should believe, uh, uh, that, friend, that we're not going to suffer uh, and that the wrath of God. I uh, will not suffer through uh, and that the tribulation period. I, I, we not only believe uh, uh, in, in a premillennial uh, uh, return of Christ, uh, uh, but a pre-tribulation rapture uh, uh, and that of the church. Amen. Uh, we're not going to usher in the kingdom, uh, uh, but friend, there is a kingdom to come. Uh, and when Christ comes and makes everything right, uh, uh, then the kingdom he'll bring with him. Uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, he said, But God commends his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. Uh, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we will not suffer the wrath of God. We'll not suffer the wrath of God in hell. We'll not suffer the wrath of God in the eternal lake of fire. We'll not suffer the wrath of God upon the face of this earth. God has saved his church from his wrath. Ain't that wonderful tonight? We all ought to be up on our feet shouting tonight that we will not suffer the wrath of God. First Thessalonians chapter 1, wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, uh, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We ain't going to suffer God's wrath. We don't have to do that. For God not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say, when the, when the rapture of the church happens, when it starts, Say, so, well, preacher, I've heard that, you know, it's kind of like over the book of 1 Peter, ain't it? You know, or 2 Peter, where he talks about, you know, in the, in the, last, in the latter day, in the last days, how scoffers shall come walking after their own lust. You know, talking about that everything's been the same uh, from the beginning. You know, I've heard people say this. There's no joke. He's, uh, there's been folks said it to me uh, that said, preacher, I, I said, I've heard that Jesus is coming all my life. I mean, your life is just but a vapor. I mean, listen, your life is but a vapor. Listen, we, we, we've been, they've been preaching it for two, some 2,000 years that Christ is coming uh, and you can believe, bet, write down whatever you want to do, uh, he's coming. We just don't know when. But he has gave us some, uh, I don't want to use the word signs, but he has gave us some scripture to tell us when he's coming. The rapture, when it starts, it's uh, going to... Start a dispensation. We're in the church age, the grace age. God's grace has always been evident. Uh, but man gets saved by grace uh, through this time that we're in now. But things is going to change. You know, the Bible said, not have to be ignorant, brethren. Um, for I would not, brethren, there it is, that you should not, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. But when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, when God gets ready to change things, when the church is raptured out, uh, then it sets in motion uh, uh, the tribulation period and then the great tribulation period of what is to come. You can read Matthew chapter 24 and we'd read tonight, uh, but for time's sake we won't do that. Uh, but the Lord said that there's going to be a tribula great tribulation period, to, uh, a great tribulation, a time uh, such has not been, no nor, no, nor shall ever uh, be again. That's going to deal with the nation of Israel, uh, but in turn deals with the whole world at that time. There is a second coming after the tribulation period. Uh, you'll find that Jesus comes. He sets everything right. He sets up his millennial reign. He's going to judge the lost. You can go read all that uh, in the book of the Revelation. Uh, but what I want to look at tonight in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, believe it or not, uh, are two types. I want to look at two types of the rapture out of the Old Testament. And there may be more over there, but I just want to look at two tonight that we can see and kind of uh, draw a picture or a shadow uh, and that of the Old Testament as we see uh, to what I read you there in the text scripture. Uh, the Old Testament has what we call types and pictures and shadows or foreshadows. And if you look at the Paul says in Colossians 2, I let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day 
or of a new moon or of the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. I think we know what a shadow is. A shadow is a dim representation of the real thing. Right? Would you agree to that tonight that a shadow is a dim representation of the real thing? And so when we look in the Old Testament, I remember when I studied uh, in, in Bible class, I can remember studying about uh, shadows and types. So one thing that my pastor would say would be, now you always have to remember that types and pictures and shadows uh, will fall apart eventually. They're not the real thing. But they're pointing you toward the real thing. And so tonight I simply want to look at two men that we find in the Old Testament I believe that would make great types in that of the rapture of the church. Now before I move on, men, you ought to be excited and looking for the rapture of the church. I mean, he said, when this mortal shall have put on immortality and this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. Uh, listen, we're, we're going to finally get uh, uh, our faith finished inside. Uh, we're going to get that, that finally we're going to get, I've got eternal life now, but thank God I'll have eternal life then. And we're going to get to experience that uh, at the rapture of the church. Uh, we're going to get to be with the Lord. Boy, ain't that something tonight? And he said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I believe that ought to be comforting to us tonight. I don't know that he has not forgot us and that he's going to come and get us tonight. Take your Bible look in Genesis 5. Look in Genesis 5 tonight and we find a man by the name of Enoch. And I think most of us knows the story of Enoch tonight. As a matter of fact, there's not a whole lot to Enoch but there's more to him than what you think. If you go to the book of Jude, you'll find out that Enoch was a prophet. Because he prophesied in that of the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. And he's seen, uh, he seen uh, uh, past the rapture of the church in the tribulation period, he's seen the advent of the Lord coming back uh, when he was coming back in Revelation chapter 19 over there. Well, look in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. And uh, all the Bible, in ver yeah, verse 21, and Enoch lived sixty and five years. And begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And then I'm going to read to you what he says in Hebrews 11. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. Because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had, this, uh, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So what happened right here? God took him. He walked with God and God took him. And I believe right here we can find, notice that he said in Hebrews 11, he said that by faith Enoch was translated. You know how many of you going to be translated in the rapture? By faith. I mean, you're saved tonight by faith. I'm saved tonight by faith. It's by faith. I have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. I put my faith in him. I put my faith in what this book said to do uh, uh, and I believe it and I trust it. I go to bed of the night trusting what that book said. I get up in the morning trusting what that book said. During the bad times, I trust what that book said. During the good times, I put faith and hope in that book right there that it's right. Uh, hey, if that book ain't right, we might as well go home tonight. Shut her down, live the best we can, enjoy ourselves here, eat, drink, and be merry. I can just wait for death to come and get us. But hey, I I ain't doing that tonight. I'm trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, by faith, Enoch walked with God. By faith, before he was translated. Listen, how much faith do we have in the Lord tonight? By faith, we are saved. I, I, but notice here, he said, by faith, Enoch was translated. He should not see death. And what I found, because God had translated for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We go back to the book of Genesis tonight and it says in verse 24 of Genesis 5, and Enoch walked with God. By faith, he was translated. By faith, we'll be translated. By faith, we are saved. He kept his faith in the Lord uh, uh, and he walked with God. You all walk with God in faith. I know. Did you know that? For we walk by faith and not by sight. Ain't that right tonight? 
You, you know what? I mean, you have never seen a rapture, have we? We've never seen a rapture. I mean, we've never seen uh, the church taken out. We've never seen another version of somebody uh, taken out of here. Standing right. you, ever wonder, you ever wonder if folk went and looked for Enoch after it happened? You know, the Bible said right here that, that he was, and then he was not. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Well, he said, well, God just killed him and, and took him. Oh, no. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Enoch didn't die. Oh no, God just took him. You realize that when me and you leave out of here in the rapture, I that will not die, we're just leaving in the rapture. Ain't that something? I mean, there we go. Reckon anybody will look for us. You know, I stumbled across something here a while back. And I don't know if it was some Jews doing this or not. I'm not poking fun by no means. Especially when this goes out on the radio. Or somebody that's just an unbeliever, I don't know. But uh, they, they would come. You could pay up front and they'll come and take care of your animals if you get raptured out of here. I kid you not. That's a way to make money, ain't it? Somebody's figured it out. I mean, I'm leaving. Uh, somebody else can take care of my cat. Hey Amen. They knock the door down, take care of her. I, I mean, hey, I really wonder, I really wonder uh, are we going to be looked for? You remember when Elijah left out of here? You remember what the sons of the prophets done? They went and looked for him, didn't they? I really wonder if people will miss us. I really wonder if they'll miss us for sure. But he walked with God. You know, when I thought about this as I studied this, uh, in every generation, God's had people walking with Him. There's always been somebody that's been... You know, the only two people in, in, this, uh, in, in these generations right here that, that walked with God was Enoch, that the Bible talks about walking with Him in these generations was Enoch... And Noah. You find Noah mentioned in this chapter, right in chapter 5, but when you get over to chapter 6, uh, you'll find Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. You know what Amos 3 and 3 says? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can we walk with God? Because I'm going to tell you tonight, God ain't going to change who He is or what He does to walk with us. So that means we got to change who we are. Amen. That means we've got to be changed. That means that things about us has got to be different and God-like uh, to walk with Him tonight. You know that when, when uh, Adam would walk with the Lord, with the voice of the Lord in the cool of the evening there, Adam was perfect. But do you realize that that fellowship got messed up when Adam sinned. How many times have our fellowship got messed up because of our sin? But notice that Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him and it said that he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know to walk with God you got to please God, don't you? I'm going to tell you tonight, it's not hard to walk with the Lord. You know, we, we talk like it's hard. You know, the Bible tells us over the book, was it, is it little John over there that he tells us that his commandments are not grievous? You know, serving God ain't hard. It's really not. It's not. I, I mean, all he wants us to do is love him, worship him, and serve him, and follow him out of this book right here. That's all he wants. That's all he wants. I don't think it's too much to ask. Seeing that he's a saved my soul, he saved my eternal soul, and gonna let me go to heaven. I think that's a deal tonight, friend. And then on top of that, he's my friend. And on top of that, he takes care of me and he blesses me when I don't even deserve it. Uh, and yet he takes care of us. How much do we walk with God? Enoch walked with God. He pleased God. I hope you're walking with Him tonight and pleasing Him. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, 
so you would abound more and more, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1. How much of a pleasing life do we have to the Lord? I hope my life's pleasing. I, I think about my life. I try to put my life in, in perspective with the Word of God. And a lot of times it would be the, the reason the Lord would have anything against me would be because of my lack of faith. My lack of trust. But you know, it was by faith that Enoch was translated. I believe that, you know, Abel, Abel was the first one to show up over there in, in, in the roll call of faith, and then it was Enoch. Uh, uh, and, and you find right here that he simply walked with God, he pleased God, and God took him. I kind of wonder if, if God just wanted to spend more time with Enoch, so he took him home. Now, let me ask you a question. Ask me a question. Let me ask me a question. Mark, would the Lord come and want to spend time with you? Would he want to take you home, Mark, and have you say it with him? That's a good question for all of us to ask. Him. Boy, I tell you, for God to come and take any, reckon what kind of sweet fellowship they had. Listen, men were already getting wicked. This was during this was getting close to the days of Noah. This was getting close into that time frame. This, this is getting into those generations right there. And, and, and I know that it wasn't exactly there, but, uh, but, but we're, we're getting into that time. And he walked with God and loved God. And God loved him. And God came and got him. You know what God done for Enoch? He got him out of here before judgment was poured out. You say, what do you mean judgment was poured out? Well, if you look in the next chapter, there was a man by the name of Noah that had to build an ark, wasn't he? Noah is a good representation of Israel right there, of the remnant that just makes it through the judgment of God. Think about it, out of all the people upon the face of the earth, Noah and seven other people are the only ones that make it through all that tribulation. When he talks about a remnant that's just going to come through out of the great tribulation period, there's just going to be a handful of Jews make it through to the other side. Just a handful. You know what God's going to do for us? He's going to get us out of here before judgment comes. Ain't that a wonderful thought? Let me ask you tonight. How many of us are ready to go? How many, how many of you are saved tonight? I hope all of you are. I hope you're saved. Because Jesus is coming. He's coming. He's coming to get me. Thank God for that tonight. But how many of us are looking for the rapture? How many of us are desiring the rapture, wanting it to take place? I understand, listen, I understand being young. I understand wanting to start a family. I, I really do understand all that stuff. But you know, at the end of all of it, after everything that John the Revelator saw, after all the wickedness he saw that was going to happen on the face of the earth, all the judgment that was going to be poured out, everything that was going to take place, all of that, you get to the end of the book of the Revelation and John looks up to heaven and he says, even so come, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of being here. I'm tired. And it has, it has everything to do with that world. That world has no draw on me whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I get so tired of looking at the news. I get so tired of hearing about the news. I, I, I mean, they're, they're making good, bad, and bad good. Now, I mean, it's just all upside down. And call, you know, I, and lie, I mean, it's just a mess tonight. And I get so tired of hearing about it. But you know what? You reckon people knew who Enoch was and that he walked with God? You know, when you walk with God and please God, folk pick up on that. You know why the Lord's left us here? You know why the Lord's left us here? Take somebody else with us. Amen. 
He, he's left us here not only to worship and to praise Him, but to live like Him in front of this lost and dying world and tell our friends, our neighbors, our acquaintances and strangers that He'll save them. That's what He's left us here for, is to win others to Christ. He that winneth souls, the book writer in Proverbs said, is wise. Be a soul winner tonight. I believe any boy we stand, we put, I, I, I'll do it like this. I put my life up against Enoch's life, and I'm telling you what, I bet it's a sore, uh, sore, lower comparison on my end. In other words, I bet I don't measure up to him. I know I don't measure up to the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, ain't you glad tonight uh, that in spite of us not measuring up to him, boy, ain't you glad he forgave you tonight if you're saved? Amen. I'm glad my sins are not there anymore. Take your Bible and go to Genesis chapter 19. Some of you are going to wonder about this. And if we did not have 2 Peter chapter 2, then I would wonder about it myself. But look in Genesis chapter 19, look in verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot saw, uh, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and, shall, and you shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. And before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Uh, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came uh, uh, in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, <clears throat> do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye only, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, uh, and he will needs be a judge. Uh, now will we deal worse with thee than with him? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that there were there at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Now you've heard me say this a lot. I, uh, when I preached on this, it makes me think they're still looking for the door. Something miraculous just happened. They were smote with blindness. They're still trying to find the door. They're not trying to get home. They're not trying to get away. If I was in some wicked foolishness I, and sin like that right there in Sodomy I, and, and I'm trying to find the door, I don't even want to talk that way. I don't understand why they were still looking for it. Why were they not trying to get away from that thing? But their heart was being so evil and so wicked that they're still wanting to commit that sin even though they'd been struck with blindness. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men uh, uh, laid hold upon his hand, and upon his hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto them, underlined that in my Bible. God didn't have to do what he done, but he done it. And they brought him forth and set him without the city, and it came to pass when they brought him forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Boy, he's kind of brazen right here, ain't he? 
Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is not it a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for that which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when a lot entered into Zoar. And then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Now remember what everything I just read and take your Bible and go to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. Hold your finger in the book of Genesis because I'm going to come back to it. 2 Peter chapter 2 and look in verse 6. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and Isis, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Boy, people ain't took the example, have they? And delivered just lot, vexed with the... Did you catch that? And delivered just lot. Now, not just lot, because we know that uh, he delivered his wife... And two daughters. You understand what I'm saying? Not just Lot, but just Lot. Vex with the fear of the conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man, look at there, dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his, what, what, what did he vex? His righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Had we not had Second Peter right here, I, I, would, I would wonder if Lot was saved, if we could use that terminology tonight. Now I really believe that uh, the angel got Lot out of there for two reasons. One uh, was because of, of his righteous soul, uh, but the other one was because of Abraham. God, Abraham and God had bargained down there uh, where Abraham was. I want you to see something about love. See, we looked at Enoch and we see a man that loved God and worshipped God and walked with God and pleased God. And boy, ain't that the way the church wants to go out tonight. But I'm determined that some are going to go out kind of like Lot. Oh, they're saved, but that's almost as far as that thing goes. Uh, notice that Lot chose to live here. You got to know something about Lot's life. Abraham and Lot, you know, uh, they, they got to striving together over there. And in Genesis 13, as Abraham said, here's what you do. He said, son, if, if, if you know, it's his nephew, I believe. And <clears throat> he said, if you go right, I'll go left. And he said, if you go left, I'll go right. You just make the decision and we'll part company. In Genesis 13, the Bible said, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. You know what it looked like? It looked like the garden of Eden. Like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, and then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Talking about him and Abraham. So Lot chose, and that to head towards Sodom. Can I tell you that when somebody backsides on God and gets cold and indifferent on God, they choose to do that. I believe Lot chose that. He may not have intended for it to end up where it ended up at, but he said, boy, this looks like a good place. I believe I'll go that way. And, you know, we've all been guilty of saying, boy, it looks like a good place. And then when we get there, it's not so good. I remember we got to Birmingham one time. Me and my wife, and it was, uh, you know, well, I told you about going to Birmingham to zoo and then going down and preaching in Tuscaloosa some 20 years ago. And we got down to Birmingham and, and uh, we, we got us a hotel there uh, on the interstate and, and that looked like a nice hotel and everything was going good. And uh, we, we got us a room and we, uh, we went to get something to eat. And man, I was in a bad part. That's what you get for not driving around sometimes. And that's the way I'm going to put it. We were just not in a good part of town when we done that. 
And needless to say, I got what money I could get back. I didn't argue and we left. Amen. I wasn't hanging around. You know, sometimes when you realize things look good, but when you figure it out that it ain't so good, there's nothing wrong with bailing out, friend. Amen? You catching on what I'm saying? When you see it's heading you down the wrong path or you're in the wrong place, get away from it. What did Joseph do? He got in that house over there. Potiphar's wife laid hands on him. He shed his coat off and run away. Amen. What was it? Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Run away from it. Get away from it as fast and as far as you can. But what did Lot do? He headed that way. There is a lot of believers that I I, I truly believe they choose to live trying in the world and for Christ at the same time. It just won't work. No man serve two masters. He love one, hate the other. Cleave the one, despise the other. Cannot serve God and man. It just won't work. You're either going to sell out or you're going to sell out to the world. You're going to sell out to God or sell out to the world. Some people are tearing their clothes on the barbed bar fence between God and the world. If I could say serving God's here and serving the world's here and there's a barbed bar fence here, some people are picking their clothes, trying to get so close to serving the world and serving God at the same time. One fella used to say this, you straddle the fence, you get shot at from both sides. <laughs> A lot of truth there, ain't they? You just get shot at from both sides. I don't understand Lot, and I don't understand uh, I don't understand his righteous soul. I'll just be honest with you now. Your preacher don't understand that. Preacher, I don't understand how he could live down there in all that filth and all that mess knowing what was right, but yet he chose to live down there. The Bible said that he vexed his soul with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now that conversation, he's not talking about what they're saying, although I'm sure they were saying wicked things, but he's talking about how they lived. They lived wickedly as if there was no God in heaven. He knew how they were living. Why do you reckon he pressed those angels to come into his house? He knew. He knew. Notice he called, notice, notice he called those men of the city brethren. Verse 7. Man, I every time I read that, I just I don't understand that. I, I don't I don't understand why why he would call them brethren, knowing the wickedness that they were into. I mean, that's like, that's like a saved man calling a lost man brother. And not only a lost man, but a man who's doing wicked. Listen, I'm talking about the rapture of the church tonight. How do you think church is going out tonight? We're going to go out like Enoch? We're going to go out like Lot. I mean, that's the question at hand. How are we going out tonight? We're going out like any? We're going to go out like a lot. I mean, he sat at the gate. He called them brethren. He was part of them. I don't think he partook of their sin. Although he was, well, I never understood this. And uh, and I preached on this a time or two. In verse 8, he was willing to give his daughters up. Talking about Father's Day. Boy, some father he was. I mean, am I right tonight? I mean, help me out, church. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known a man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you and you do uh, to them uh, uh, as is good to your eyes. Hey, you daddies tonight ought to beat their, beat their eyes black and blue tonight if they to do that. I'll help you. These were vile and wicked men, but yet he vexed his... Righteous soul. That word vex means to plague or to torment. Or to disquiet or to disturb. I believe it really did. I I believe Lot was bothered living there. But if you noticed, he let his his daughters marry some boys from that place. Did y'all catch that too? Remember he went to his sons-in-laws, so his daughters married some boys from that place. 
His influence was gone when he went to talk to them. I wonder how the influence of the church is tonight. I wonder how, you know, I ask myself, reckon I have good influence with people. Could, could I tell somebody that they're lost and they would at least sit there and listen to me about me telling them how to get them saved? What Jesus has done for them. Would people listen to me or would they mock at me? You know, the Bible said right here in verse 14, He said, up, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But He seemed as one that mocked unto His sons-in-laws. He had been there, he called them brethren, he'd sat in the gate. You know, he'd sat in the place of, uh, uh, of ruling, if you let me say that. I believe that he really loved Sodom. Why do I say that tonight? Look in verse 16, and while he lingered. While he lingered. They said, we're going to destroy this place. It's going to be destroyed. And while he lingered. That means he just kind of hung around. Notice it said, While he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon his hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. I don't, I don't think they wanted to leave. I'm not sure if they thought it was real that they were going to destroy. I believe they hung around as, as long as they could. Now, I know they had family there. I understand that. But if they were really concerned about their family then, why were they not concerned about their family before? If you're going to try to get your family one, you better win them now. I mean, if God come in and said, hey, tomorrow I'm coming to get to church, would we be up all night trying to get our family in? Or would we be out trying to enjoy our last minutes here? I mean, I'm asking us tonight, which way are we going out? Are we going out like Lot or are we going out like Enoch? Because I can guarantee you this one thing. If you're saved, you're going out. He laid hands on his wife. I believe his wife loved Sodom so much, that's why she turned around and looked. Everything she had was down in Sodom. And you know, them angels said, don't you look back. Don't you look back. He got them out of there. The Lord got them out of there before destruction could be done. Notice what that angel said. Hasty escape thither in verse 22. For I cannot do anything till thou become thither. He said, I, I can't do a thing. He said, I can't do anything. I can't send destruction. You know what? The tribulation period, uh, the wrath of God cannot be poured out upon the face of this earth until we're gone. The Lord has made us part of the beloved and He will not leave us here. Let me say that in the time that we're living in, it is much like the days of Lot in the days of Noah. And it's getting there more and more every day. Wickedness is reigning more and more every day. And we're about to leave here. So which way are we going to leave? Are we going to leave like Enoch? Or are we going to leave like Lot? One that's walking and pleasing God? Or one that's loving the world? And got to be drug out kicking and screaming. Let me tell you this tonight. The rapture is going to happen. I may leave out of here in death. And if I do, that's okay. I'll wake up in glory. Amen. I'll be the ones that come back. If you leave out of here in death, then you get to be the one that comes back, you see, with the Lord. You know, he said he'll bring them with him. You know what that tells me? That when we leave here, we go to be with him. Be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. So I believe that we could all agree tonight that the rapture is going to happen. I don't think there is ever an argument that that's going to happen. And you know, I've been taught about the rapture all my life. I mean, I grew up in a church that, that believed that since I was a young boy. I mean, I've, I've known about the rapture and the catching way, the calling way uh, of the church all my life. I've been taught that. 
And you say, that's why you believe what you believe, partly, but mostly because I've studied it out and found it to be true. Just like the two types, shadows and pictures that I just showed you. Before God would destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, He had to get Lot out of there. But before He would destroy, let, no, let, the, uh, let the flood come upon the earth, I believe Enoch left. But let me ask you this question. What if you miss the rapture? What if you miss it tonight? What's going to happen? There's going to be people turn around and their husband will be gone, but they will not be. Or their wife will be gone, or they will not be. Or their children will be gone, or they will not be. Or their mom and dad will be gone, or they will not be. Or folk that they love, or folk that they work with. God forbid folk that you go to church with. So what happens? All in Noah's day was destroyed just as in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. So I believe that what we learn by the word of God in, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, I believe he tells us in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering unto him. We're going to be gathered to him. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter asked from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a fall away first. Now, I'm parked here and looked at that for a long time, and we can apply that to today. There's a great fall away right now. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, talking about uh, the, the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that uh, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. There's an argument on who that is and it and who he is. I'll be honest with you, I don't know. And I can give you a lot of ideas and what I think, but I don't know. But I do know what verse 8 says. And then that wicked shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, talking about the Antichrist, whose coming is after the work of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusions, that they might believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. I believe if you miss the rapture, it's too late. I believe it's too late. He said, God will send you strong delusions. You'll believe a lie. I believe that lie right there is the Antichrist. I believe that's what that lie is talking about. He said that they, uh, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. I believe if you miss the rapture, it's too late. I believe if you've heard the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and you reject Christ, it's too late. That's why you need to get saved now. You need to be saved now. I believe He's coming to get the church. Are you saved tonight? Let's bow our heads tonight.